The Atari 8-bit line of home computers first showed up in late 1979 and ran for more than a decade with various form factor and memory changes. And you know what? I knew absolutely nothing about any of them. As I've mentioned on my channel a few times, I was a console kid and I didn't have any family or friends that owned a computer, much less one capable of playing games. Years later, I became aware of these but still had no experience actually using them. Even when emulation became available, the pull of nostalgia was never there, so I didn't go out of my way to pursue them. When Retro Games recently announced they were doing a mini version of the Atari 400 that played its games and programs, I thought now was the time to go back and see what I was missing. Before we jump into the games, let's have a quick look at exactly what this product is about. The form factor itself is based on the Atari 400, but it has none of the functionality. It's a mini console, so none of the original buttons or keys work. It does have USB ports for controllers, but anyone looking for a more authentic experience won't find it here. And speaking of controllers, it comes with one Atari CX40 joystick, one of my most loathed peripherals in the history of gaming. The 400 Mini does work with other wired USB options and you'll definitely want to use them. It also works with USB keyboards if that's your thing. The HDMI output gives you 720p with a few screen size options, 50 and 60 hertz support, and a CRT filter that is a darkened blurry mess. I do despise fake scan lines so your experience may vary. This device requires at least a 5 volt 1 amp power brick that does not come with it. The 400 Mini name here is also a touch misleading because it actually runs software that was compatible with the Atari 800 as well as the XL and XE lines. It even runs games from the Atari 5200 console. Looking back, I was shocked at how many games were released for this line of computers. I was thinking a few hundred and it was many times more than that. That gives us a lot to test here, so let's get to it. Before we do anything else, let's take a look at the built-in games for the 400 Mini. It ships with 25 licensed games to give you a taste of what that era offered. Since my inexperience with the Atari 8-bit computers is absolute, I had not played a single one of these before. Fortunately, the easy-to-use interface was nicely done, it supports save states and game rewind features for the software kicking your ass, and you can even bring your own games. We're gonna look at that later, but first, here are the included games. The simply named Basketball couldn't be any less impressive, even by 1979 standards. It's a fast-paced, one-on-one, full-court game that is actually fun for a few minutes, but the lack of variety in terms of moves or dunks means it grows tiresome fast. Probably a good throwback for those that had it as a kid, but not something you'll be returning to frequently. Asteroids doesn't really need an introduction. This is based on the arcade smash hit that has been ported to every gaming system in existence. Boost around shooting space rocks. You've played it before and there is nothing special about this version. Again, fun for a few minutes, but not a ton of replay value here. Centipede is another classic arcade port and this one is fairly good. It's fast, smooth, and feels like it should. I was never any good at it, but I always appreciate a solid arcade conversion when I find it. In 1981, this would have been a must play. The Atari 8-bit line of computers also got Missile Command, another really impressive arcade conversion. This one has a barrage of missiles raining down on your cities and you must shoot them down before they wipe them out. It plays well here and I spent quite a bit of time with it. Miner 2049er was an excellent addition to this lineup and a standout. You play as Bounty Bob and you must explore every inch of the mines here while avoiding mutated monsters. The platforming gameplay is loaded with obstacles and challenges from the simple act of collecting items to shoots and teleporters. It's almost as if someone took the single screen Nintendo arcade games like Popeye, Donkey Kong, and Mario Brothers, mixing them up into this amalgamated masterpiece. I really enjoyed it. Berserk was another one that I enjoyed. This is a run and gun where you have to navigate a maze full of enemies without taking damage or touching the walls. You can shoot in eight directions and the challenge really ramps up quickly. The visuals are primitive, but I still got a kick out of the animation. 
Bristles is a game that has you painting various sized houses that are loaded with elevators, ladders, and obstacles. It's really fast and really hard, but I can definitely see a good game here. Some stages have a competing painter that's undoing your work, and as the houses get bigger, it keeps you working hard to stay ahead of him. When Capture the Flag first popped up on my screen, I was blown away. This two-player split-screen maze game is played from a first-person perspective and 360-degree movement. I had no clue such a thing was even possible on this technology, much less it would run well enough to actually play. The bottom of the screen draws the map so you can see where you've been and the other player. The goal is to get out before the other player stops you. It's one of the earliest examples of this type of gameplay that I've ever seen. Another first-person surprise was Encounter, an arena shooter where you must attack and defend yourself from aggressive enemy drones. The arena is displayed in the radar below so you can see where your opponent is coming from. Again, I had no clue this tech could do this type of game, and it runs really well. It even has some nice explosion effects when the enemies die. Good stuff and an eye-opener for someone new to this platform. Flip and Flop is something I thought I'd enjoy, but I quickly grew tired of the constantly swapping characters and unintuitive gameplay. You first must use a kangaroo to jump on the tiles that are lit on an isometric playfield. Then you have to take a monkey who hangs from the underside and essentially do the same thing. The kangaroo gameplay is fine, but the movement of the monkey feels all wrong. Definitely one of my least favorite games on this device. Mule is a multiplayer strategy game that I could never properly show off in a simple overview like this. Hell, even after a few sessions, I'm still not sure I understand it. The basics are collecting resources and growing your wealth. Each of the four competitors takes turns, which are affected by how well you are doing. Not something I'll be playing again, but fans are likely really glad to see it. O'Reilly's Mine is like Dig Dug but with floodwaters. Go into your mine, secure your minerals, and avoid the water and monsters. It's really challenging and a lot faster than other games of its type. It was a great inclusion that I had never heard of before. Wavy Navy is a Space Invaders clone that has you fighting from a boat on rather rough seas. The idea presents a very different way to play this classic, but I can't say it has any long-term appeal. Mowing grass is one of life's least pleasurable activities for me. I've never enjoyed it, even after I got a fancy riding mower that made short work of it. Hover Bover takes that task and makes it even worse, with dogs and neighbors trying to stop you from finishing. It's an appalling nightmare of game design that I wish I could delete. Lee is a multi-screen action game where you must avoid traps and collect lanterns to proceed. Once you learn the play area and how to attack and avoid enemies, this one becomes quite fun. It was originally a licensed Bruce Lee product, but that has been stripped away in this re-release. It's 20 screens of treasure hunting action that is well worth your time. Millipede is really similar to the earlier Centipede we went over in terms of quality, but it doesn't play quite as smooth. It's still fun, but I think I prefer Centipede overall. The Seven Cities of Gold is a strategy game where you can explore the new world, forge alliances, and even be a conquering monster. I've only scratched the surface of this one, but it appears to let you pretty much go where you want and interact with your discoveries as you see fit. Keep your mission well stocked and make sure you have some peaceful places to return to, and you'll do just fine. Boulder Dash is another one similar to Dig Dug, but this time you must avoid the giant rocks as they fall and fill in the areas that you've dug out. You can use those rocks to smash enemies as well. It's extremely challenging and plays well. I had played this one on the 2600 before, but this version is a whole lot better. I was really excited to try Electroglide when I saw the visuals. This is another one that looks like something that should have been well above the capabilities of the technology. Unfortunately, the gameplay doesn't live up to the visuals. After spending some time trying to navigate these roads, I came away not wanting to go back. Visually spectacular for the hardcore, but there's a little here beyond the programming wizardry. Battlezone is based on the arcade original and it does a nice job of recreating the look and feel. It's nowhere near as smooth, but the 3D gameplay is mostly there. For those unfamiliar, this was a wireframe tank game where you move around and destroying other tanks and munitions. 
If the original was a favorite of yours, this is a very solid home conversion. Henry's house is a weird platformer where you must navigate a twisted, nightmarish concoction of a home where everything can kill you. Collect items to reveal the key to the next room. It plays really slow, but the draw to get through the obstacles sustains the fun factor. It's tough, but I enjoyed it and thought it looked pretty good as well. This space combat game was a sequel to the original Star Raiders, but it didn't start out that way. It was supposed to be a movie tie-in to The Last Starfighter, but that was dropped before development finished. Things were tweaked a bit and the Star Raiders license was added. I was not a fan of this at all, however. Repetitive gameplay and shallow design elements left me running for the menu button. I wanted to like Airball here, but man, the control did not agree with me. The story has a wizard turning you into a ball and you must find your way out of a maze of rooms without getting yourself popped. The isometric gameplay punished me, however, and left me getting frustrated just trying to move about. There's a decent game here, I think, if you can adjust to it. Crystal Castles was sort of an isometric Pac-Man clone where you must navigate a bear around the play area collecting gems. It's a fair conversion of the arcade original, but I can't say I ever cared much for that gameplay. Next up is Woomp, or is it Womp? I'm not really sure, but who cares, because this one is a beast visually that plays really well. It was released in 2007 long after the death of Atari's 8-bit line but the 3D forward scrolling effect is still incredibly impressive. Basically, you need to keep your ball bouncing through the tube and navigate the pits that fill the screen. I really enjoyed this and would love to see someone port it and expand it to something like the Sega Genesis. When you hook up an analog-based controller such as the PlayStation 4 pad, two hidden games will open up. The first of these is Castle Crisis a four-player Pong-style game where you must protect your castle from other players. Fire bounces in between the four castles while the player attempts to minimize the damage by using a shield to bat the fire away. It's essentially the old arcade game Warlords. The second hidden game is Super Breakout, which really needs no introduction. Use the ball to break the bricks. Game design at its most basic. Since the 400 Mini supports playing your own game files, I decided a small test suite to see how this performed. Since we are a Sega channel, I of course have chosen a few titles you should recognize. To play your game files, just drop them on the root of the USB drive and select Media Access from the menu. Pingo is an excellent translation to Atari's 8-bit line. As many of you know, you guide your penguin around the screen crushing enemies with ice blocks. It's a simple concept backed by a devious level of challenge. The 400 Mini had no issues playing it that I could find. I chose Buck Rogers here because I wanted to see how the original arcade was handled. The forward scrolling is imitated by lines on the ground and the enemies fly toward and away from the screen smoothly enough to be convincing. It's nowhere near the arcade visuals of course, but still as playable as any early home version of it. I was point blank stunned at the Frogger conversion. This is actually superior to the arcade original visually and plays just as well. I was always a fan of this game and this is one of the best versions of it I've ever played outside of the original coin-op. I was also impressed with the visuals of Zaxxon. It's like a zoomed in arcade version with a great close up detail. It's really fast and very difficult however. You have next to no time to judge your heights for the gates and death greeted me countless times in a very short period. Visuals are there, but the difficulty overpowers the experience. Miss Pac-Man is a timeless classic and the Atari 8-bit computers did it justice. This played great and the visuals are strong enough to not ruin the experience. Our final test game is Rampage. I was really looking forward to this one because I was a fan of the arcade but I hated the way it looked. The buildings and enemies are done well enough, but the characters look just awful. I also didn't like the way you climbed the buildings. The animation is all wrong. I'm sure the kids that had it back then loved it, but coming at it with eyes of someone that had played it at home first on the Master System, this was a monumental disappointment. There's a few things I want to leave you with about the Atari 400 Mini. The first thing is the included controller is there for nostalgia only and should be left in the box never to curse your hands again. This device works with a slew of wired USB controllers that play these games so much better. 
hook your PlayStation 4 controller up to it, or one of the 8-bit Doe classics, and you are good to go. The second thing is the support for Atari 5200 console games. Because this system used that funky analog stick originally, you need to set it up before you play the games. You also need to tell the emulator that it is a 5200 game for it to run properly. It works well but takes extra effort to configure. Next is the importance of using a proper power brick. I broke out a cheap Chinese brick originally, and sometimes the games wouldn't start, and they all had bort sound in gameplay. You need a good quality power brick that supports above one amp to avoid these issues. Finally, for those of you looking to discover a treasure trove of gaming goodness, I think the 400 Mini delivers. You have to appreciate the time period, of course, but whether you owned one of these back then, or you're just curious now, some of this stuff plays fantastic. Add your own games and you have captured an entire generation of Atari machines in one device, or what equates to hundreds of very playable titles. Fans of Atari's 8-bit home consoles will appreciate this the most, I think. The games the Atari 8-bit computers played were like 2600 console games on steroids, something I believe even I would have enjoyed in its heyday. They look and sound so much better than anything I played before the NES. The natural progression of this device is to move on to the Atari 16-bit computers. If it's half as well done as this one, it'd be well worth our attention. I'm SegaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.